Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about earthquakes. Uh, we're going to talk about how they're caused, how we identify different parts of them, different scales that we use to measure them, and the different types of waves they generate, and possibly the types of devastation and destruction that they cause. All right, without further ado, let's go. So what is our definition of an earthquake? Well, a seismic earthquake, which is a naturally occurring earthquake, is defined as the vibrations of the earth produced by the release of energy from rocks placed under differential stress. Sometimes you see the word strain. Now we talked about this word differential stress when we talked about a metamorphism. Differential stress means it's not equally applied. It's not the same on all four sides when we talk about confining pressure versus differential pressure. Okay. Differential stress means it's unevenly applied. It's applied usually in two directions, up and down or left and right, but not in all the directions at the same amount of time. So you're basically taking rock or a group of rocks and putting them under uneven well, stress. The elastic rebound theory. So what basically happens is you have a fault, which we talked about. That's a break in the crust. Something happened here that broke the rocks here. Okay. And what's trying to happen is, you know, nothing's going on. The two rocks are just sitting in. Now, what starts to happen is these two pieces on either side of the fault are trying to move in opposite directions. So what happens is right on that fault, the rocks, which is in this picture symbolized by this little stick here, are put under differential stress. It's trying to move this way and that way. The energy is directed in differential directions, not in all four directions. And so what starts to happen is it starts to build up and it starts to strain. Now, just like the piece of wood that you see in the picture, it can stretch a little bit and it's got a little bit of a give but eventually, if the strain builds up over a long enough period of time, what will happen to the stick? The stick is going to snap. Just like that. And when the stick snaps, you know, you get two pieces of stick. Well, when the earth does that, what happens is it snaps right at that fault, and part of the rock moves this way, and part of the rock moves that way. And like you see in this picture, you could have rivers whose whole courses are diverted or shut off just because something like this happens. Okay? And in real life, you can actually see that in this picture. This fence was not built that way. If it was, they probably should have fired the person who built the fence. This fence was a solid, continuous thing, but there was a fault running probably like right here, coming out at us. Ooh. Okay, And when this uh, strain was placed on these rocks, they were strained, they were strained, they were strained, and eventually they just slipped past each other. And you got this new settling of the crust underneath where this rock was pushed this way, this rock was pushed that way, okay? And you had a new normal. So the study of the waves created by an earthquake is known as seismology. And seismology has let us understand a lot about what's going on with an earthquake. And in turn, it has let us understand a lot about what's going on inside the earth by seeing how the waves generated by the earth travel through the earth. We're basically studying, like we just said, is the waves coming out of wherever the energy was dissipated, wherever that differential strain was applied and the rock snapped. Now, when we talk about an earthquake, there's a couple of terms that we need to know. First one, obviously, is the fault. The fault is the break along the rock where the movement is actually going to happen. Okay. Now, the actual point where movement happens is what we call the focus. The focus is almost always located deep below the surface, a couple of kilometers below the surface. It can be closer. Sometimes it can be on the surface, but it usually tends to be below the surface. Now, this word epicenter, you've all heard. The epicenter isn't where the earthquake happened. It's the point on the surface directly above the focus. Okay, the focus is where the earthquake happens and the epicenter is the point directly on the Earth's surface, directly above the focus, closest to the focus on the surface. Okay, really important. You will see that as a question. Now, the tool that we commonly use to study all these waves and focuses in epicenter is called the seismograph. And it looks like what you see before you. You've seen these in disaster movies and stuff like that. The little pen and it all of a sudden starts bouncing all over the piece of paper. Well, what you basically do is you take a device and you bolt it to the ground. And when you bolt it to the ground, it's going to measure any vibrations that occur. Okay, The pen is allowed to stand still but the ground moves underneath it. And so as the ground moves underneath it, the little pen records it as peaks and valleys, which we, we see in movies and stuff like that. And the bigger the peaks and the valleys, the stronger the wave that is being generated. Now, in the picture that you see before you, you see that all the peaks and valleys are not exactly the same. The reason why is because you can generate different types of waves. All right, so when we talk about the waves, like you saw in the picture before, there are three main types of seismic waves. We have P waves, S waves, and surface waves and they differ in how fast they travel what they'll travel through and what they do in terms of damage and 
to the and what they do to the ground as they move through it okay so if we look here okay remember how i said earthquakes are really important for understanding the inside of the earth well that's actually how we know all the stuff that we did in the lesson yesterday most of the information that we've garnered from you know the inside of the earth we've come by studying waves so if you look here okay you can actually see that there these blue lines represent the movement of p and s waves and so you see that they move all the way through this but if you notice you see how only p waves get through here why well because of the way they move p waves can move through both solids and liquids whereas s waves can only move through solids so once you hit that liquid outer core the s waves get blocked that's an indication that the center of the earth or at least the outer core portion of the earth had to be liquid the bending and the deflection is also important the fact that there's places where there aren't waves is also important that has let us understand what is going on inside the earth so the first type of wave we're going to talk about are p waves p waves are known as primary waves that's what the p stands for they are the first waves usually to appear after an earthquake can happens okay now when we look at p waves right what happens at a p wave is if you look at it here the yellow arrow represents the direction that the wave is moving and then the red arrows represent the direction that the particles that the wave is going through so what effectively happens is as this yellow arrow moves the land goes like this it compresses p waves are what we call compressional waves okay you'll learn this in physics as well compressional or longitudinal waves so basically the easiest example i can give you is p waves cause the ground to turn into a giant accordion think about an accordion what do you do an accordion you squeeze it and it relax and squeeze and relax and squeeze and relax and that's what happens as a p wave travels through a particular medium the second type of wave is called an s wave appropriately and they're actually called secondary waves and they are usually the second wave to show up during a earthquake or received at a seismic station and s waves are relatively simple same thing here you've got the yellow arrow so the energy is going this way the wave wants to move this way but it makes the particles go like this okay so the particles move perpendicular to the direction of wave motion as opposed to a primary wave where the particles move parallel so in a p wave the energy goes this way and so do the particles they go eh, 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 eh. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Whereas an S wave, the energy goes this way, but the particles go, I know, incredibly high tech stuff I'm showing you guys here. Now, using the information that we know about waves and how fast they travel, the fact that P waves travel faster than S waves and all the other stuff that we just talked about, we can calculate the location of any earthquake on the earth by using what we call a wave delay method. Okay, and basically what you do is you calculate the lag time between when one wave arrived and when the secondary wave arrived. You use that and you calculate the radial distance away from your station to the earthquake's epicenter. Okay, and we have to do what's called triangulation because we need three stations to figure this out. Why? Well, let's look. Here we have the station of Paris. And for Paris, we did that wave delay method and we found out that the earthquake was 8,200 kilometers away. Now that could be 8,200 kilometers anyway in a circle around it. So we draw a big circle, that's the orange circle. We use the second station of Nagpur in India and we found out that the distance was 3,400 kilometers away. And so we drew a circle there and you see, boom, it hits the orange circle there, but it also hits the orange circle there, which tells you it's in one of these two locations, but you're not sure which one. And that's why you need to triangulate use a third station darwin australia darwin australia says it's 4900 kilometer radial distance and so you draw a circle with a radius of that and boom they touch right there where that little red star is and that tells you that the earthquake was located in that spot and so earthquakes are quite common in fact the picture you're looking at right now each little red circle represents an earthquake of different intensity that has happened in the united states and puerto rico but when i say intensity what do i mean well Intensity basically is the degree of shaking that happens at a particular location. Now, if we want to measure intensity or strength of an earthquake, okay, there's actually three scales that we can use. The first one is called the Merca modified Mercalli intensity scale. The next one is called the Richter scale, which you're most familiar with. And the last one is called the moment of magnitude scale. Now, if we look, the modified Mercalli scale basically has to do with how people or individuals or structures dealt with the vibrations and that can vary a lot based on how well built the structures are where there are a lot of people around and things like that and so if you're looking at the scale in front of you you see it uses roman numerals it goes from 1 to 12 okay and 12 being just absolute utter devastation you're talking stuff gets flipped up into the air you can see the ground moving as if it was like water waves like stuff you see in the bible basically okay, it is biblical 
like destruction. <laughs> okay. Now the Richter scale is the one that we are most common with. Uh, was created by an American in 1935. Okay, and it basically describes the strength of the largest seismic wave that we see. So you look at a seismograph and you, based on how big that peak or valley is, you're going to determine what it is. Now, it's a scale that goes from 1 to 10 and it works okay for most earthquakes, but when you start getting to the higher ranges and you start getting to like differences between 9.6 and 9.5 and things like that, or even 8.5 and stuff like that, it gets a little bit eh, not so great. And so what we did is we invented a third scale, which is called the <clears throat> moment of magnitude scale and this measures the total amount of energy so remember we've been talking about kinetic energy and stuff like that so it measures the amount of energy that gets released along a fault this is much much better for understanding large earthquakes okay and so for example if we look at the earthquake that happened in 1964 in alaska it had a 8.4 measurement on the Richter scale. But if we look at the amount of actual energy that was released, the moment of magnitude gives it a 9.2, okay? The 1906 earthquake on the Richter scale had a measurement of 8.3, so almost the same, a little bit less than the one in Alaska, but in terms of the energy released, it's only a 7.9. So it actually gives you an idea that this one in Alaska was much, 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 much more powerful. And so if you're looking at the picture now that's on the screen, you can actually see how the energy released by the different numbers on the moment of magnitude compared to tons of dynamite being exploded. So that'll give you a really good indication as to what's actually going on. So if you want to pause it and look at it right now, probably be a good time. All right, so when we want to talk about death, destruction, and mayhem, we want to talk about wave damage. That's what does the damage in an earthquake. So what are we talking about? Well, wave damage is linked to the intensity of the shaking, so how strong was the wave, the duration, how long was the shaking, what's the geologic profile of the landmass, which means what is the land made of, and what's the nature of the structure? Was it well built? Was it poorly built? Okay. And so intensity, obviously, the stronger the earth shakes, the more likely you are to get, you know, things broken, death, destruction, and mayhem. But if you have something that shakes even at a medium strength, but for an incredibly long period of time, there's only so much that a building can handle. We do build buildings in certain places to handle earthquakes, but an earthquake where it lasts minutes, you know, instead of seconds, that's going to be a lot. The geologic profile, what's the land underneath? Certain types, solid rock doesn't vibrate as much as loose sediment. So if you have layers upon layers of sediment, sand, silt, clay, stuff like that, those places are going to vibrate incredibly strong. They're actually going to amplify the amount of damage that you have. And then the nature of the structure. Well, this one's important because if we look, the picture that you see in front of you right now represents the, the after effects of an earthquake in Haiti a few years ago, a very devastating earthquake in Haiti that was about an 8.2 or an 8.3. Buildings were completely and totally wiped out hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives millions of dollars billions of dollars in devastation absolutely horrible event but why well because in in haiti a lot of the buildings are built either well you know well below code or not at code at all what do i mean by code well, there's certain rules and regulations that you have to follow when you want to build something a lot of the structures in haiti unfortunately don't have those rules attached and they're just put together when the earthquake happened they just completely and totally collapsed if you compare that to the picture that you see now, this is that 1964 earthquake in Hawaii, in Hawaii, in Alaska, sorry. Um, and if you look, that building obviously did collapse, but you see the other buildings around it are in relatively good shape. Why is that? Well, the reason it's like that is because in Alaska, they know earthquakes are going to happen, and so they build buildings to code. Now, the one that collapsed is obviously either under construction or demolition, and so it hadn't quite, you know, had all the bells and whistles in order to support you know or survive an earthquake so the nature of the building is incredibly important and finally we get to the word that you guys have been waiting for all year tsunami tsunami is a word that comes from japan and it stands for seismic sea waves and these are basically giant waves that are created as an after effect of a very strong earthquake in the ocean or relatively close to the ocean and what basically happens is the waves travel from the earth to the water and get amplified and they get amplified to the point where they become these huge waves that can cause all sorts of devastation like we saw in japan in two, uh, a few years ago in 2011 and like you've seen in, in numerous movies okay and like you've seen in your local chinese restaurant or japanese restaurant in the picture that you see above you which actually represents a actual tsunami that was recorded in japan 
All right guys, so that does it for the video. Make sure that you're going over your notes, make sure that you're paying attention, and make sure that you do your quest. All right guys, bye.